Um, but just like to introduce you, um, uh, Alison Dring, um, who's featured in a, who's, who's talking, talking about two sides of your professional life, I think, uh, today. One, one of which is this wonderful uh, project in Mexico, uh, which is a pollution cleaning facade, the form of which uh, is interesting in itself. And, and that was uh, done under the auspices of a company called, a brilliantly named company called Elegant Embellishments. I thought this is this is this has got to be the future. This is um, so this is not hair shirt um, sustainability. This is actually kind of really something else. So that's, that's very exciting. And I think you're also going to talk a little bit about the, your work with uh, Made of Air, where you've developed a new uh, a polymer, which is is literally made from uh, atmospheric carbon, or mostly made from it. Um, which is also super interesting. So thanks so much for, for joining us tonight. And um, again, I hope when you're in town next time, we can welcome you to the studios and meet the students. But thank you for, for agreeing to do this tonight. So thank you. Thanks, Will. Um, it, it's such an honor, really, to be, uh, to be speaking here tonight. Uh, I do wish I could be in person. I do miss these um, being in these environments just doesn't feel the same sitting here in Berlin in this room, <laughs> but uh, but uh, I'm grateful nonetheless to uh, to be able to show you the work uh, today and to have your feedback. And um, yeah, with that, I'm just going to launch right in. Um, share my screen. So maybe you can, um, oops, just indicate that you've seen it. Can you see that, everyone? Is, yes, we, it's clear? yes, yeah, we can see that. Thank you. Thank you. OK. Um, I'd really like to start here. And this goes back a little bit for me in my career. Um, as we mentioned, uh, I have a, I had a company, I still have technically a company called Elegant Embellishments. I should start by saying. Uh, it's a love-hate relationship to that name. It's a name that my co-founder and I invented in a pub in South London a long time ago, never thinking that it would ever enter a book or a publication and sort of uh, thinking in a kind of tongue-in-cheek way about modernism and um, also thought it was a funny label because embellishments was certainly not a way to describe uh, the work that we loved and the work that we wanted to do. So a way to kind of keep us in check, I guess, as a good name should. Uh, but I'll start here, and I think uh, this is maybe appropriate uh, for this audience. This obviously is uh, The Domino House by Le Corbusier. And I like to start here because I think this is, this is really what, um, when I entered my architectural career, this is what a building um, was meant to be. And this, these were the priorities that went into designing the buildings that we inhabit. Um, I think Corbu really intended this building to have the role of, of manufacturing and housing. He's thinking about manufacturable systems. He's thinking about scale. Um, I think he was thinking about the new machine age to be minimal and adaptable and to use as little program as necessary and to get the user to make changes into the architecture. So letting life kind of make its imprint here. And I think that what's interesting here is the tech that was appropriated to make this was really about manufacturing tech. It was about structural tech. Um, but we've moved on. And I think anybody that's kind of worked in the profession already can see that this is where we are now. So this is, um, if, you're, if you're familiar with um, construction these days, this is BIM. This is what a building looks like to um, somebody designing it uh, from their desktop. And we have hyper control over systems these days. This is, um, this is how we see uh, our interior space. We have multiple ro roles, hybridized functions. We're able to control more and more complexity inside our buildings. This is the role of tech in buildings today. Um, the machine of this building is networked. Um, we are able to measure, we can adapt, we can predict all of our interior environments down to 
to uh, millimeters and, uh, and other metrics. But when we move outside our buildings, uh, we are left in a kind of chaos. And this is really the context that I'd like to introduce the work that I've been doing for the, for the last 15 years. And I like to start with Beijing. And I feel a bit sorry for Rem Koolhaas because I keep showing this picture in relation to air pollution, but you know, that's Beijing for you. Um, and I'd, I'd like to just call out probably what you're thinking, which is that's a lot of air pollution. You're not looking at the architecture and, and maybe you didn't notice that that was a, an LMA building until I mentioned it. And I would say that that is because air pollution and indeed atmospherics are the content of our cities. And you can see that a, a cloud like this of smog is going to have a behavior changing power that perhaps the architecture doesn't even have. In Beijing right now, this is an extremely dangerous condition. It's volatile, it's a powerful urban, urban atmosphere. And what I wanna point out clearly is that the architecture here is inert. It's not making any reference to the very powerful um, forces that are acting upon it. So when I started out in, in, in work that I've been doing, I asked uh, of myself and of my profession, what is architecture's role in the climate? And I think when we have system of control in the interior, uh, we have an answer to that. I think when we move into the exterior and we certainly start to imagine our cities, uh, we are left very small in the equation. And the other part of my, my line of questioning as I went into my, uh, my work was, do we in building cause the problem or can we mitigate it? So air pollution, just to be extremely specific about what it is, because I think there's, there's a lot of context around this topic. It's actually made up of um, certain pollutants, which are um, NOx, you have SO2, you have volatile organic compounds, you have fine particulate matter. They're all extremely harmful to health. Um, I'm sure we could go on and on about what air pollution and the impact of that is, but I think it's fairly well documented. What I want to focus in on is there is a technology that's titanium dioxide based that we encountered in 2001. And this was right about the time that it was patented and encapsulated into a, um, a paint, a kind of coating matrix. And this technology, which is a nano form of titanium dioxide, uh, it uses only sunlight to convert noxious gases, so um, oxides of nitrogen into calcium nitrate, which is like a harmless salt. Um, and this is a technology that was developed for coatings for architectural applications. And for us in 2001, this could be activated across the whole city. In fact, the inventors of this technology had imagined that we could paint our cities, our streets in it, um, they were thinking already about the facades of our buildings because of the proximity of our buildings to air pollution, which is generated by cars. So this was already intended to be an architectural application. The problem with air pollution and indeed this technology was that for scientists, uh, it looks like this. And for the rest of us, it looks like this. And when we encountered this technology, it was a, in the form of a white coating. Um, and it had no ability to translate the message or indeed to um, engage any conversation or reduction or any architectural component um, into it. It had no way of, of gelling those things together because it had no form. So this is the world's leading sustainable air pollution technology and it comes out as a white paint and i would just point out that it's it's hard enough to have an invisible problem like air pollution and now we had a somewhat invisible or formless solution so in the biological world there's a link between surface enlargement height. And we very early on started to study corals in this way. 
Um, that titanium dioxide technology reacts only with sunlight. Um, it's an endlessly renewable resource. The problem, as I mentioned, is that the technology wasn't benefiting from any form. So we studied corals. And um, corals are interesting because they sit on the ocean floor. And usually in a, in a place like the Caribbean, for example, where the ocean isn't extremely deep, uh, the corals can benefit from sunlight filtering through the water. And they need this light to be able to grow. And so when we thought about this, um, this, this organism that can kind of grow and reformulate itself and increase its own surfaces in order to survive, we started to think about that link between light and surface enlargement in an architectural way. So in the case of working with a light activated technology, we started to propose that a shape or an ornamental form could improve the efficacy of this technology. So we set out to make a substrate for this technology. And this is a product that we invented, produced, uh, manufactured at big scales and installed on projects around the world. And we named it ProSolve. And it's a facade module that can reduce air pollution in cities using only sunlight. Uh, it actually uses surface enlargement to increase the reception of light to activate the technology. And it also clusters that technology into onto facades. And as I mentioned, facades are in close proximity to air pollution. So when you when you want to apply this technology, it makes sense that you can cluster it where you have a hot spot in the city so that it can be more effective. And that's that's really what we started to think about was the friends of buildings become activated, not staying inert to a climatic condition that was happening around the building. And so this facade product really acts as a kind of clip on to buildings. Um, it's not doing an insulation job. It does do a kind of breeze soleil, um, but it's sort of Trojan horse function is to actually reduce the air pollution in front of the building. So some other uh, images of that, that we did a lot of testing, as you can imagine, going from having an idea to actually producing something is quite a tall order, uh, especially when you're a just founded company trying to survive in London right out of grad school. So this was a, this was a start. Um, and we did know from the very beginning that we were going to need to experiment and test and grow the prototypes until we could reach a buildable scale ourselves. Um, we didn't see an industry all around us that could support us in making an air pollution reducing facade module. There was really no precedent for that. So we had to kind of experiment and work with the channels we had. And as with any kind of self-initiated project, one does end up in an old warehouse doing experiments with polymers. So this is me way back then. Uh, I think I was in, a, in an art studio in Hackney Wick at a friend's place. Uh, I think I was mixing polyurethanes there. So I had learned to cast a mold. I learned how to make a mold. Um, I contacted uh, 3D systems and had them 3D print. And this was back in 2006. Uh, to print our first um, products to be able to test if they would be reproducible. And it was a super interesting time. So I learned a lot about how polymers work, um, how manufacturing could work even at a small scale. And you can Im imagine that at this time, this was like the, the beginning of smart materials. So there wasn't a lot before this. There were kind of the traditional building materials that you had on hand and a lot of history attached to those. Um, and smart materials were on the rise, so surfaces that could engage, um, you know, more intelligent building systems were appearing. So we had imagined that in all of this kind of new spirit of, of smart materials, that doing kind of super sculptural, highly ornamental shapes uh, would be somewhat easy to make given the kind of you know, new era of 3D manufacturing, et cetera. And we were very, very wrong. So this is, um, this is the lay of the land in the construction materials world. And 
this is a you see a lot of, of paneling you see a lot of rectilinear orthogonal flat materials um, I can't say much has changed when you really look at the mainstream um, there's a lot to do with like the the economics behind buildings that determine whether we need these modular systems and how flat they should be but one thing was very clear to us when we set out to make this um, the building products manufacturing industry was not going to help us. Uh, these were the shapes that we asked to be made. We didn't want to set up a factory on our own. We were very much looking for contract manufacturing to see if we could scale this up and put it on a project. And no building producer, building product producer would, would touch it. So we had to move industries um, to be able to get our product made. And we turn to an industry that had been making these shapes for over a hundred years and in the car industry it, it's kind of funny right? because this is um we were then turning to the industry that had created the problem we were trying to solve um, but in a kind of in following that logic at the same time a lot of the manufacturers that were working in the car industry in germany uh, we're tired of working there. We're tired of making parts for Mercedes-Benz. I wanted to diversify and wanted to start doing something more interesting in buildings. So we actually were able to engage with, um, with manufacturers working in that industry. And they found it relatively easy to deliver parts like these, uh, mostly because the tolerances for products in the built environment are not as stringent, not as difficult to meet as they are in, in the car industry. So I think that's, it became a kind of interesting partnership right from the start in making this product. Um, one thing I would say about the shapes, these are very intentional shapes. Um, when your problem is in the air, the form of the solution has to be aerodynamic. Um, and this shift in thinking and also this industry jump from the building industry to the car industry is really important and I'll just relate that back to the climate because for the climate you have no standard you have to be able to look for the solution wherever you can find it and I think later on in my work this shift when we jumped away from the building industry and into the car industry to solve the problem this is a shift that I've made so many times in my career in the name of the climate and I think that's just become a kind of, a, it, it's become my way of working that um, I don't accept industry standards. I don't participate in the profession as easily. And I tend to stay on the, on the edges of things to be able to see if there's a better option. And I think that we were, I was already starting to do that in this project. Um, and diversifying is obviously the key to it. But we made these shapes with the, with the manufacturer in Ulm. Um, they produced them in plastic. And you can see that the process was not straightforward. So we started with very small prototypes. Um, we built the first tiny set in the London Architecture Biennale back in 2006. Um, we then went on to show it at the Venice Biennale in 2008. So you can see in the picture in the middle here, we had jumped up a scale and obviously it's expensive to make big tools when you don't have a, a project or an investor or something coming in. So we were very much just getting grants and kind of um, producing stuff and testing stuff or working with the university now and then and, um, and really just moving things along organically. Um, we learned a lot in, in this prototype development about materials and forming methods and installation and sort of lots and lots of things that you I think I would have normally taken for granted if I hadn't had to uh, develop a product for a building so this was a the, a lot of learnings came in these scale jumps and I would say that my co-founder and I my co-founders there on the on the far right side holding the biggest ones that's Daniel um, I think you know we both come from architecture training <laughs> and through this project uh, we really became manufacturers and in 2012 after this prototype um, phase 
we installed the modules on a hospital in Mexico City. So in 2013, um, ProSolve was installed on a 2,500 square meter facade on the Torre de Especialidades. This is a hospital in the southern part of Mexico City. It's a new building, or was a new building at the time, and the, uh, the Ministry of Health actually funded uh, this building and the director of the hospital personally wanted to do something about air pollution in the city. Um, I think Mexico City has a terrible reputation for, for air pollution. I actually don't think it's the worst in the world anymore, but I think in the 90s or something, it was like in the top two. So the citizens on the street in Mexico City are very aware of their problem. Um, I don't know why that is. Maybe the media really hammered it down for them, but we found that it, that, uh, it was much easier to develop and com be commissioned for a project like this when the problem was so obvious to the stakeholders. And I can't say that we were asked a lot to do projects in Europe, and I think it's mostly because of that. I think in Europe, while we do have uh, significant air pollution problems, it isn't something that people believe about the the cities or the countries that they live in in this in in Europe. So I would say that uh, a lot of times we were we were being asked to look at projects or installing on projects that already sat in that context. So just to to um, to explain this facade a bit more, at 2,500 square meters, uh, this facade is reducing the pollution of around 1,000 cars a day. And it is still active. It uses only sunlight. It uh, slows down the wind speed to be able to trap pollutants onto the surfaces. And then they are um, put through a kind of um, uh, oxygenation process. And the elements of, of NOx that are coming from cars and onto the surfaces are converted into harmless amounts of CO2 and water and calcium nitrate. The calcium nitrate as a salt is typically used as a, as a fertilizer. So you have, um, you know, if you were extremely optimistic about this kind of technology, you'd say that the rainwater washing away the calcium nitrate was actually providing a kind of garden space underneath the building. Here's another look at it. Uh, you can see how the shapes are, are doing this, um, this trick with the wind speed. A lot of times in cities, you have what's called a laminar airflow. And that just means that the wind is kind of moving along the surface of the building. And if you have a flat surface on a building, um, which is, as you can see behind it, is like an Aluka Bond product or something, um, that laminar airflow is moving really fast. And you're not going to be able to trap the pollution that's being carried in that wind um, onto the technology in order to have it be um, broken down in time. So if you had just taken this titanium dioxide pollu pollution reducing technology and just painted that uh, Lucabon behind it, it would not have been effective. So in, doing, in putting ProSolve in this condition, we are actually creating the a vortice, vortices of wind. So they're being um, they're being caught in the in sort of holes in the facade, if you will, and spun around. And this is something that we did test quite a lot. We did a lot of simulations on the aerodynamics behind this, and we do get a much slower wind speed. And we also are able to move the wind behind the the modules themselves. So not only are we getting the front sides of this product, but the back side is able to be effective against air pollution as well. And additionally to that, the surface enlargement is engaging with a lot more light. So we have omnidirectionality in the shapes, which means that the light is able to bounce onto a lot of the shapes. This isn't a technology that needs direct sunlight. It really needs like, a, like an ambient sunlight. So I would say it's a, a kind of, well, maybe a brighter gray day in London, <laughs> not a not a deep dark gray day in London, but that would be enough to kind of trigger the reaction. So I'll just move along here. This is um, this is sort of how it was 
built in Mexico City, so we had to um, we had to think about it a little bit in terms of the the shapes that we were using. This is based on a, pro, a, a Penrose pattern, so it's a very difficult shape to install, and so we had to break it down into groups. Um, tricky to to be able to understand how the pattern goes together, but in the end, we're only building with two shapes. And I'll show you, this is the underlying grid. Typically in, in buildings, you have orthogonal grids. This is a Penrose grid, and that is actually a kind of five-fold symmetry pattern. Um, there are two shapes involved, so you get really good economies of scale over this thing, and this is not a, a custom um, facade. This is actually made of two easily to easy to reproduce parts. Uh, the skinny blue di uh, diamond that you see there in the far left and the kind of fatter green diamond and we refer to those as the X and the I and you can see how they repeat and what we've done is derive a shape in, within the X and the I diamonds and um, we've pretty much just built it up from there and it worked kind of three-dimensionally from this pattern. What we've also discovered in this pattern is there are lines where we can connect a lot of the kind of structural points of the tiling system. And these lines are referred to as Aman lines. They occur mathematically in these Penrose grids. So we were able to take a somewhat complex looking facade and translate it back to steel vertical lines that could be uh, repeatable onto a facade. So even the um, even the pattern of the steeticles is repeatable. I think we have an ABBA um, pattern here. So we continue with these projects, even though they don't always get built. Um, this is a project that uh, we were commissioned to do. This is the Orange headquarters uh, for West Africa. It was based in Abidjan and Ivory Coast. And uh, this is taking the idea from the Mexico project up a notch. Uh, this is 4,000 square meters of facade using the ProSolf product. And um, very interesting project. Um, the reason why I say was is because this one sadly will not be built um, due to things, reasons out of our control. But I'd like to show it to you anyway because uh, this one went a little above and beyond what we've done in the past with the ProSolve product. And that is, um, it's actually a double curved surface. So we had worked in the past with single curvatures, very, very shallow curves like we had in the, in the hospital project. And this one was more like a, like a torus, a donut shaped um, facade. And to be able to use a Penrose grid on a double curvature um, had never been done before. And we were uh, maybe naive <laughs> to go in and, and think it would be easy enough to solve, um, but we did solve it and it is buildable. And uh, unfortunately we didn't build it, but this is, um, but the system is interesting nonetheless. Um, this project involved three material systems so we used steel props along the slabs of the building uh, to be able to hold the facade at each floor. This is an um, eight story building. And typically what we did was have these props on each building that you can imagine that they're a bit like a bicycle ring. So the, the structure of it, the engineering is such that you would have a stack of bicycle rings that could move up and down but couldn't twist and we secured them onto the facade and found points using a script to be able to, to locate the points on the back of the, um, of the skin of the facade. Um, very complicated work involving quite a lot of grasshopper, as you can imagine. Um, we also, these, uh, a, a lot of what we're doing in here is taking the structure, the visible structure away so what we've done in the past with these vertical steel substructures, we were trying to get rid of and embed structure into the tiling system instead. So this was really our plan was to be able to preserve a kind of more pure view 
from inside the building uh, without being interrupted by the structure. So this is really, uh, and again, what I'm talking about is the, the structure itself is, um, is a lot of bicycle wheels stacked on top of each other. And we did work with, um, with a lot of data sets to predict the correct positions for all the props onto the facade. And we had to do quite a bit of custom engineering on the on the parts to be able to make sure that we weren't we weren't going to end up building an entirely custom facade, but that we had repeatable parts that could be more flexible. Um, and this in, in scripting this facade and, and we did work with several partners to do this um, involved, as I remember, kangaroo springs and, and various things to get the double curvature to work. Um, we ended up with a structure that had very tight tolerances, more than uh, a building typically would. And you can see the parts here so that we had bent aluminum structure that would attach to the plastic panels. And this really made up the, the surface. These are a lot more plain than the Mexico project. So we weren't as concerned here with the wind speed, but more with the, um, with the shapes and making sure that they were flexible enough to be able to deliver this shape. Um, the, uh, there's a connecting joint piece here in the far, in the bottom left corner, you can see that's the that's the extrusion that we were using to um, to form the structure in the panel, and uh, we had to have those custom bent, and uh, we had to work with aluminum spares outside of our industry that had never worked on a building before. Um, we had I think 70 different lots of profile parts and 600 unique joint pieces going into this building. Um, and our, it felt, it started to feel like quite a custom task, but the point for us was to make it manufacturable, make it buildable. And um, obviously when you're working in a place like Abidjan, you have to think about the tools that they have on the ground to be able to build. So we had to design um, quite a lot in Germany that would, uh, a lot of the customization had to happen in Germany so that by the time it landed in Abidjan, it could pretty much be clipped in place. And uh, I think the idea behind that was the, the more precision we can give to the part, the quicker the installation was. So unfortunately, I don't have uh, built photos of that one. And all I can say about the, the ProSolve projects is they do continue. We are working on one right now in Brazil, in Sao Paulo, which will be built next year. Um, and with that, I can also say that we are not continuing to do that work in air pollution. Um, I think some of the reasons for it, I'm going to explain to you. Uh, in the in presenting the, the other side of the work that I'm doing, this is the Made of Air projects, and I would just say that there's a <laughs> it's um it was a lot of great work in air pollution, and uh, but I think it's occurred to me that uh, we have to put our focus on something that's more urgent, which is the CO2 crisis. So I'm going to jump now uh, into our, our, um, our other company, which is called Made of Air. And uh, here, I'd like to start here. And, and actually, perhaps I should stop for a second. Is there, are there any questions? I don't know if it's, uh, if it's making sense. Yes, yeah, it's making perfect sense. But but oh, Pete, Pete does have a question. I was going to say that. Sure. Sorry, Alison. Can you? I don't know if you can hear me. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Oh, good. That's something. Um, no, I just wondered. It's interesting because you said that um, you described the system as a kind of different type of brie soleil, which I which I quite understand. If I'm if I compared it, if I compared the the facade to uh, putting solar panels on the roof of a building um, rather than the Brie Soleil, 
my question would be does it have to be related to a building you know because nowadays you, you might have a, a field where you would put place all the panels flat you know on the ground or angled towards the sun of course so i suppose what i'm saying is it does it have to be can it be a standalone system do you think absolutely and I think that's a that's a really great question. And I love the fact that you brought up solar panels because we talked about this quite a lot when we were developing the business case around this product. And I think the the issue with solar panels is you can have a direct relationship to the energy balance, to the maintenance costs of a building in putting solar panels on your roof. So you can do this kind of contribution to the environment, but you can also be self-sustainable as a building. And I think with with ProSolve and with air pollution, that's not the case. Um, there's no mandate for, or there's no incentive, let's put it that way. There's no incentive for a building owner to do anything about air pollution in front of their building. It certainly isn't going to help their maintenance costs. Um, it's going to do somewhat little to the interior air quality um, because it's really filtering something that's occurring outside and would not have entered the building in any other way. And um, I think that's that was a kind of wake up call for us that there wasn't going to be that this that this problem and this proximity on the street was a civic responsibility and not a private building owner's mm -hmm. responsibility. And therefore, Yes, the if we were to evolve this product, I think it detaching it from buildings would be a kind of interesting avenue mm -hmm. because where we really wanted it to go was to the air pollution and it wasn't always going to be where a building was. Sometimes we were being approached um, by cities about um, the edges of parks that were along traffic ways in big cities. And I think that condition where you have um, kids playing or people walking very slowly and you have this kind of circulation of air pollution happening along that edge. Um, mm. That's a very dangerous condition and that was something where we always thought this should be uh, embedded in a different way. This technology should be embedded there and clustered there. So I think if we were to develop it further we would have gone toward more like these developing a barrier system. Good. No, no that's good because I've got a nice lightweight structural frame that I, I'll, I'll give you for a small percentage that we'll, uh, we'll collaborate on. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> no, uh, thanks, Alison. I, I just had one other comment about that, which is um, there's a, uh, a couple of projects that have been refused planning permission recently in the city of London on the basis, this is a kind of new precedent on the basis that they their carbon no, the embodied energy of the of of the proposed structures was not seen as being mitigated or whatever sufficiently. Really? Reduced. Yeah, there, there's a Norman Foster. There was a kind of funny tower that was. I mean, it's kind of pointless. I'm oh, sorry. I'm sure it's wonderful, but it was a <laughs> it was a wonderful outlook tower. A thing called the Tulip, nicknamed the Tulip. But um, if you could argue that a project uh, clean the air, you know, as a kind of planning condition. Then, then I think maybe you could. Anyway, whatever. That's that's just a, just a thought. But um. yeah, yeah. No, I think that's that's really been a lot of the business case between uh, behind some of the ventures that I've had is the what's the incentive for um, for for architects for developers to do anything about their buildings in terms of the environment and and some of it is now linked to rents. Um, but a lot of it has to do with planning permissions. So especially in like C40 cities or, or world capitals where you have uh, a lot of competition for building sites, um, these things are becoming more and more important. The cities have more and more leverage on those points. Thank you, thanks. Sure. I'll just jump in on that note because I think that's um, it's an interesting transition there um, to embodied carbon. So. I'd like to just um, talk a little bit about how we saw the context around Made of Air, where this idea was born. Um, so when we had been working with um, air pollution for quite some years, and it occurred to me in that process pretty early on that 
um, that the product that we were making and installing on projects around the world, it actually wasn't sustainable. Uh, what we were doing was kind of employing a very interesting technology and, and tackling a very complex problem. Um, but if you were to scale up our product and put it on every building in the, on, around the globe, um, we would be doing irreparable harm to the environment. And I could not reconcile this. Um, the embodied carbon in the substrates of the materials I was using, it wasn't resolvable. There weren't industrial materials that I could work with to make the parts that we needed that were going to not be super harmful to the environment. And though my impact was indirect, um, the burden of that, all of that, really weighed heavily on me. Uh, in my own work, I had to admit that I was causing the production of 30 tons of virgin plastic per project. And this was just the reality that was attached to my decision. And at the same time, um, the kind of message around me was don't use drinking straws. So I think there was like a, that was a real wake up call to me that uh, it wasn't just about consumer behavior and my behavior in my own life. It was about my ability to influence a decision on a building scale volume and that the materials and the material decisions were um, crucial to those buildings having a, a better impact on the environment. So I think that's really where I sat. I had a real crisis around this for many years. Um, trying to find ways to pivot out of um, virgin fossil plastics. This wasn't a product. I wasn't making a product that could use recycled content. Most building products can't. Um, there are actually a lot of plastic products in buildings. Um, about 20% of the global plastics market is going into buildings. So it's not an insignificant amount. And I had to learn some things firsthand in those years. And I would say one is our ecosystem is extremely fragile. Uh, our system is out of balance. Um, carbon is the building block of life. And that our architectures can be built on chemistry. So I formed with my co-founder a company called Made of Air. And I'd like to explain a little bit about what that name means. Um, what does it mean to be made of air? Um, do I mean that we're working with atmospherics? And the answer there is, well, sort of. The trees are made of air. And uh, I think this is something that we should be learning when we're children, but for some reason we don't. Uh, so instead, I'm going to quote the Nobel laureate Richard Fenman uh, in saying that trees are actually made up of 95% carbon dioxide. So a tree is getting its mass from air and water. It actually eats carbon dioxide. You can think about it that way. It's not, I, I sometimes say absorbing, but it is, it is an eating process. Um, what happens is the, the carbon dioxide is brought into the plant cell. The, um, the sunshine, the, the UV light is pulling the carbon dioxide apart and essentially spitting out the oxygen. So the plant, the tree is, um, is respiring with oxygen and it's using the carbon dioxide, um, sorry, it's using the carbon that's left over to build itself. And I think that's just really fascinating. I, I was really struck by this idea when I first heard it years ago, was that the tree was actually building itself from the air. And the other thing that strikes me as very fascinating about this is that the, there's no other planet that we know of in our solar system and maybe the universe um, that can do this, that can precipitate life from air. And we have this incredible system that we did not invent. That's not a technology that we made um, that happens around us. And we rely on it for so many things, for our food, for our materials, for our, for so many things, this resource is important to us. And it's doing this very elegant job 
of um, taking CO2 in and building itself up. So what's the problem then? Well, climate change uh, and population growth. And because of those two things, we are now entering an era of resource scarcity. Um, when I do follow the IPCC reports, and there's one particularly worrying one from 2019. And in there is, um, it is a lot about land use and how we're going to max out our land use very soon. Right now, we are already 70% uh, of our non-ice land uh, across the globe is shaped by human activity. And a third of our land is already employed to provide food and clothing to humans. So by 2050, we're going to have cities that will urbanize sometimes by 800%. This is not something we can avoid. So this is our near future. And our land use will be maxed out. So if you put things in that context um, and really think about a finite world, um, we can't just plant more trees. And I think that's it's been a contentious thing to say, but the facts are the facts. We have a finite world. We've got a lot of people to house and to feed and a lot more coming. And um, we have to be able to preserve some of the carbon sinks that we have, the forests that we have. And we need the rest of the land to be highly productive. And, in the, and at the end of the day, we're going to have to build a lot of cities. So according to Bill Gates here, um, we're going to need to build a new New York City every month for the next 40 years. And so if you consider that these straightforward things and this finite world that we're in, um, my big question was, where are the building materials going to come from? Traditionally, they've come from subterraneous carbon. And now we're going to have to see if we can move our resources from below ground to above ground and perhaps to the air. And this is really the domain which I've set up made of air. Um, I'd like to explain a little bit. You've seen probably these faster charts before, but uh, here's another one for you. And this is, um, this is how our political leaders have decided that our, our pathway is to a, one point, a limit on 1.5 degree uh, global warming. And you can see that with a lot of the strategies we have right now, we're not going to make it. Um, what this graph can also tell you is that we're going to need net negative emissions to be able to deliver on that uh, carbon target. So what is a net negative emission? This is any process that will remove more CO2 or other greenhouse gases from the atmosphere than they produce. And this is different from lowering our emissions, which we hear a lot about. So uh, when we're lowering emissions, we're getting there, but we're not going to get there in time. And in order to get there in time, we need processes that will do something about the existing CO2 that's in our atmosphere and has been there for the last 150 years. Um, what this graph is showing is that carbon removal, and that's those net negative emission strategies, mean that we can actually draw down CO2 from the atmosphere and we can deliver on our climate targets. But without these technologies and these kinds of negative emissions, we cannot. Um, so this is another statement right now. This is something that we have to accept also in the architecture community. I think we have to acknowledge this. Our cities are carbon emitters. Everything that, that we build with all the materials that we have are, have embodied carbon. So in the process of making them, um, we are emitting some materials worse than others. And I think probably people in this room understand exactly what that means and what the footprints mean. Um, but we have to accept that the future of our cities is not building less, it's building more. And the materials that we have are causing emissions to go up. One scary thing I can tell you is that uh, if we go on using the traditional materials we have right now, um, 
by 2050, we will have emitted 350 gigatons of CO2 into the air. And that is just in construction materials. That's not in energy. Uh, that's not in building use. That's actually just the materials. So this would wreck our carbon budget. This is an enormous number. And uh, there's very little that, um, there's very little doubt that materials have this um, ability to make or break our climate budgets. So it made a very, how I've just to get, I've kind of set the stage of, of what the problems are and how they're related to the built environment. So our cities are carbon emitters. We accept that. But what if they could become carbon sinks? And this is really where we've set up Made of Air um, around how we can have materials store carbon from the atmosphere and use those materials to build our cities. So historically, you can see in this graph, this is showing the carbon pool. The carbon pool is our reservoirs of carbon below ground. And historically, um, we were storing carbon underground for a long time. And as we entered in the industrial age, we started to use that carbon and deplete those carbon pools and make stuff, make cities, make everything that we need. And the, the byproduct was the CO2 going into the atmosphere, which has caused uh, the climate crisis. So our next century should be about getting that CO2 out of the air and back in the ground. And that's really what Made of Air's mission is. We are working to reverse climate change using materials. So I explained a little bit about what a carbon sink is. I'm sure you hear about a lot about that. Uh, when it relates to forests. And that's true, the a tree is able to store CO2 effectively, efficiently, uh, while the tree is alive. But what's not commonly known is that when the plant materials are harvested and they begin to decay or decompose, all the CO2 that's stored in the material is gonna re-release and go back into the atmosphere. So you can look at it as a carbon sink as long as the tree is alive. And we hear a lot of strategies about lengthening the life of the tree, but we also use trees. We use wood. It's a productive, um, we have productive forests. We use wood for construction and um, we use wood for lots of things um, to be able to avoid emissions for worse materials. So uh, it's really not an option to leave trees where they are. Um, and I'll explain a little bit how we see that. So this is, a, this is how it works um, for us. We're producing a carbon negative thermoplastic material and it's made of CO2. And you can follow this chart from the CO2 that's in the air. It goes into the tree or any other plant material. Uh, usually when the tree is harvested for products like, the, like timber uh, for construction, for example, you have downstream from that, you have a lot of waste residues. Um, where we come in is the very small chip sizes that are left over from the harvest of the tree and the sawdust. Um, these are very large quantities of waste. And typically what happens to that waste is the, um, the sawmills can't, uh, they take a loss in trying to gasify it for energy, for example. They take a loss in trying to dry it for other uses. So typically they're burning it in open fields or they're landfilling it. And in either one, two of those scenarios, um, the CO2 stored in the material is gonna go back in the atmosphere. So we're seeing a loss of CO2 from all of that plant material. So what we're doing is coming in and interrupting that natural process of the decomposure of the material. And we're converting all of that wood waste into biochar and really what that is, is a pyrolysis step. So we're baking the, the wood waste at a very high temperature, low oxygen oven, and we're getting a kind of charcoal. It's similar to charcoal you would use in barbecue, um, but not. So that's, um, what we have is uh, in there in that process, that pyrolysis process is a transfer of the CO2 from the wood material into elemental carbon. You do get a release of CO2 in that step, but it's 50% of the CO2 that's stored in the material 
and 50% is going to be converted into elemental carbon. Once you have that conversion into elemental carbon, you don't have a re-release of the CO2 back into the atmosphere for at least a thousand years. So this is a permanent form of carbon sequestration. So what we're doing at Made of Air is producing the biochar and we're refining it through a series of processing steps where we can combine it with bioplastics and we can make a thermoplastic granule that we can sell to manufacturers that, so that they can use as an alternative material to plastics and to other mined materials. And I can explain a little bit about what we're doing there, but we're targeting the durable use cases in the built environment, in cars, um, in consumer goods, and that sort of thing. So this is the material you can see on the left there. That's the granules that we're working on. This is how we sell. So we sell these pellets to manufacturers that are already working with injection molding or, or uh, compression molding. And uh, they, in turn, use the material to press into finished products. And they can be, um, they're in various, various markets. Um, it's good for many, many things. It's a bit dizzying sometimes having a material company um, because we deal with so many markets, but typically this is what happens. The environmental performance of the material is outstanding. So it is a carbon negative material. Um, the global warming potential, so usually this in indicator in any life cycle assessment of what impact that process or product has on the environment is called a global warming potential, uh, GWP. And most materials, in fact, in this case, a plastic would have a 1.85 tons of CO2 emitted per ton of material. And our material is able to take two tons of CO2 out of the air per ton of material. And what that means to some of our customers right now is not just that negative two, it means about four because they have a supply chain and they have a problem and uh, the impact is we're going to take four tons out of their supply chain problem. And this has become a really interesting change in how materials are sourced and how they're seen in supply chains. This is what it looks like for plastic. This is what it looks like for buildings. It's very interesting. We are um, using the material to produce panels right now, but it can be used for a lot of applications in buildings like window frames or ceilings or wall panels or cabinetry. Um, a lot of the non-structural elements of buildings can be used for. And here you can see the typical pallet that um, building owners and architects have uh, to build something and, and the attached CO2 footprints, the global warming potential of each one. And when, for example, we start to take on uh, an incumbent aluminum panel that's being used on a facade, and instead they specify our panel, um, the differential in their whole CO2 footprint of their building can be 13 tons uh, of CO2 per ton. And that's quite, that, that makes quite a difference when it comes to calculating the, the whole um, building's footprint. So I think it's, I mean, it's kind of interesting because the built environment, um, it contributes to about 40% of the globe's CO2 emissions. And I think that what we're seeing is there's a developing conversation about embodied carbon happening with, with building owners. Um, developers are starting to approach the selection of building products differently. Uh, before they would invest in a technical performance or delivering a building with low maintenance costs or passive energy, they're now thinking about buildings like companies think about supply chains. They're trying to tie uh, sustainability badges like LEED or BREEAM to higher rents. And in order to meet those thresholds, as we just heard, um, if you can't, you can't get a planning permission, for example, if you don't. Uh, and some of these certifiers, um, if you don't meet a certain uh, carbon footprint threshold, um, you won't be able to have it certified in a certain way. You won't get to rent it to the companies you wanted to rent it to. You won't get to charge the rent that you had in mind. And they start to look at their whole product, which is their building, in the same way that a company would look at its supply chain in a whole way. 
And if they see a material over here that's high emitting, then they're going to need uh, either a low emitting or a negative emitting material over here to rebalance the emissions across the whole project. And this is the only way both building owners and companies with supply chains can reach net zero without buying offsets. So this is really the, the actual math. And that's becoming very interesting how, um, how those two things are linked. There's a lot of um, considering the part to balance the whole thinking out there. But I'll go back um, just on, on how we came into this. Um, this is the first material compound that, that we produced in Berlin. This was in 2011. We did this in the Polymer Technic Lab in the TU Berlin. And I think I would just say that why I think why we've been so successful, because obviously, you know, this is like a this is just where we started. We didn't know where it was going to be, and it was just an open-ended experiment. But in a way, it's never stopped being an open-ended experiment for us. And I would just say that I think the reason why we have been successful from this point on in this carbon materials economy is that we didn't come from material science. So I am a trained architect. My co-founder is also a trained architect. And we just never stayed in our lane. And we've always stayed in a position of curiosity. Uh, we've stayed amateurs on purpose. And in doing so, we've been able to unlock rooms and have conversations that would typically be siloed. Um, I never worried that I wouldn't be taken seriously. Uh, I knew I wouldn't be taken seriously. And so what was clear from there was that the material I was making and its processes were going to have to prove themselves. So these are the first pressed panel prototypes that we made in 2015. We, we built molds, we designed the molds, we had them cut, um, we pressed them in a factory, we tested how installation would work, we tested the formability of the material, the design surface, the quality, the weathering, all the kind of uh, first things you can test on a small scale as, a, as an idea to make a facade from this material. And then this year we delivered um, with Audi our material in the form of a, of a facade for their dealership in Munich. And this was a process, a, a series of, of first engagement projects with Audi over two years, where we were testing the material in facade conditions. And um, now we've scaled up to this size. This is about 500 square meters. Uh, we did produce this panel ourselves. And we are now talking to Audi about um, the timeline for rolling it out across their 4,000 dealerships worldwide. So this was um, the production. We um, started with the biochar. We put it through a series of processes and we compounded it uh, with bioplastics. And then we, uh, with Audi, developed a design. We set the molds. We put a team in place. We put a factory in place and we pressed the panels to go on to the building. And this building actually uh, received a DGNB gold status as of a, a few months ago, uh, really thanks to this facade. And uh, another great thing that we're proud of, this is the world's first carbon negative facade. Uh, the material, how we're forming it, um, made of air is a startup. So this is all about scale for us. If we don't deliver at scale, we're not delivering for the climate. So we are targeting channels that are outside the built environment. Um, we are working with automotive, we're working with consumer goods. We're focused on products that have longer life cycles. And the reason for that is we want to be able to take the CO2 from the air, capture it through um, plant materials, and then apply it to utilization cycles that are long. Um, also considering that typically materials for these use cases are some of the nastier CO2 emitting materials. So if we can replace the need for those with a carbon negative material, we're doing that much better for the environment. Uh, we're working with a lot of big companies. And like I said, we're trying to deliver on scale. So um, even though we get approached by quite a lot of applications and companies and, and 
people and it's been very exciting, we are trying to focus on uh, companies that can deliver at very, very high volumes. So we partnered with Audi for the last three years on their built environment. Um, we're working with H&M. Uh, we deliver the sunglasses that the model's wearing here. I would say that the sunglasses are not our target um, product, typically because we can't control what happens at the end of life. Um, but it's an interesting way to work with a really big company and start to think about which materials and products in their supply chains are closed loop or can be closed loop. So uh, we're moving forward with them on discovering which products we can apply the material to. We're also working with BMW on parts for the cars. Um, and what, the, what these three companies have in common is a very, very ambitious sustainability targets that they can't meet without negative emissions materials. Um, I would just say that the, the one way we see this developing in the built environment is by being very, very visible to end users. Um, you don't think about materials having uh, a message uh, that they can directly convey to users. And we always wonder, why not? Um, if you see something black on the front of a building, you should know why it's black. And uh, if it is carbon negative, I'm linking a couple of things, but if it is our material and we're able to store carbon uh, from the air in that material and build the building with it, um, we think that should be recognized. We think people should be aware of that. They should know that their sunglasses are the same thing as in the dashboard of their car, as in the same thing that's on the front of their building, and that they're being that those materials are being um, calculated, they're being audited and they're being disposed of at end of life um, in a good way. So we see it as a kind of new certification in buildings. And I'll just end here with a couple of questions that I had. And um, I think they're more like, they're more discussion points, but I think maybe it's, it, there, are, there are common themes that we have in our company. And I think that apply to the wider kind of built environment. What is, the end of life of a building. And I was surprised to hear that when a building is demolished, in Germany at least, you have, um, you have kind of two options. You, they separate the materials into combustibles and non-combustibles. And the combustibles, as you imagine, um, get combusted for energy. And the non-combustibles do get recycled or landfilled. And we're starting to think a lot about what happens at the end of life? How do building owners account for the materials and products that are in their buildings? Um, and if they have a value, for example, a carbon value that's attached to a carbon market, maybe they would behave differently at the end of life of that building. So this is something that we are exploring right now as a company with the industry. Um, another thing to think, we hear a lot about circularity um, we've gone from a linear past uh, to circular present. Um, and where do I think it's going? I think we're going back to linear, um, but in a different direction. Uh, what Medevera seeks to do is to decycle CO2 out of the atmosphere and back in the ground. So even though we have a material that's circular, it can be reformed, it can be ground down, uh, it can become new products all the time. Eventually, we want it to go back in the ground. And we have a material that's safe for a landfill, and it's a permanent form of carbon. So essentially, while we want to create utilization cycles around our products, we do want to have a linear process of decycling um, CO2 back into the, into the ground. And lastly, how can we design buildings to store carbon rather than emit it? And this is something that I've kind of always thought about. This is always my um, ambition was to see how architecture can play a better, a better role, a more impactful role in mitigating the climate crisis. We should be thinking about how a building is going to make things better and not how we can do less harm. Thanks so much. I'm going to stop there. And uh, I don't know if we're a little over time, um, but if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. Uh, 
Um, yeah, th thank you, Alison. That was that was fantastic, very and and super inspiring. And I'm I'm sure we have lots of, of questions, but um, I I just thought it's it, it's just very interesting how you in a way highlight the the importance of the of your role as a as an architect as a non-specialist actually um and um, and and the and what role you can have as a non-scientist and i think that's it's not it's not stated enough the the role of the generalist or the architect the designer is is uh, is underestimated because you you're putting these pieces together um which of course Pure science does a very good job of the pure bits, but they can't, they don't match up with the other stuff. So, um, so thanks, thanks so much. Um, I think, I think Pete had, Pete had some questions here, but. Oh, hey, I don't have like... a question. I just had you a did... comment which I, which I wrote because I thought it was quite amusing because you've got outside the building, you had a monolith. And I wondered if, is it a coincidence that it looks like the, the one from 2001? Yeah, I'm sorry. To, it's, <laughs> you designed Actually, it that way. I, I did. You know, I always considered that made of air material is always like its own category. So it's not a plastic, it's not a stone, it's not wood. Um, and I always thought about that monolith from 2001. Like, what would that feel like? And we have a joke, we have a running joke in our company that we're going to make okay. it out of made of air someday. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you. Scott, Scott, I think you had a you had a question or a comment. It fl sort of flashed up, but it it disappears, and I can't I can't see where it's yeah. gone. So, um, hi, Alison. Um, thank you for the lecture. It it, it really was great for um, our students. Um, I, I made a comment that it it had everything: um, technical, design, soul searching, practice, commerce, uh, and um, yeah, thank you for giving the lecture and, and, and being an inspiration for our students and, and, and do keep going um, with your uh, endeavours. I just wondered if you could, you know, some of our students are quite early in their education and, um, and, and their careers. I wondered if you could give them, you know, a few golden words of advice. Yeah, sure. Um... <laughs> I think, um, yeah, advice. I'm trying to think of like what I would have, what I should have heard <laughs> when I was starting my architecture education. I think, um, I think the best thing that I, that I've kept from all these years is don't stay in your lane. Um, we don't have time for, for professional trenches. Um, we are in crisis mode. I am completely with Greta Thunberg on this. Um, I think we need to act now. And I think the architecture education is, is really, really well prepared for this kind of problem. You, I think if I remember correctly, it was extremely diverse education. So you're actually getting something extremely useful for many fields. And I would just say like, don't don't stay in your lane. Don't don't go into the profession and do it the way it's always been done. I think architects have such uh, such polymathic experiences, and we as a globe need that. Yeah, thank thank thanks so much. I I totally agree, and I thought the professional. I made a note earlier about avoiding the profession. Um, and I think it's it's a point well made. I think this is everything. Unfortunately, in education, is to do with becoming part of the profession. Actually, of course, the best bits of the best people who design things and all the rest of it always remain on on the edges of it or outside of it because, um, the, the, you know, this idea of professionalism is a rather rather odd thing. So, are there any questions in the room? I think yeah, we've got one over here. So I'm just going to pass it. Richard Dippard. Hello there. Um, I've got three kind of technical questions, uh, one of two of which are serious and the third one's a bit trivial. Um, <laughs> the two serious questions are um, you, you, you compared your material with various different building materials. Um, but I wondered of that, 
how it compared with timber. So if, in, if you were to be using timber cladding as opposed to your... The um, second kind of serious question was about flammability, because it's one of the things that we're having to deal with quite a lot now following the Grenville uh, tragedy in, in London. And so you know, does it burn? You know, one, one might imagine that it does being, being pretty much carbon. Uh, and the third tri trivial question was, does it come in different colours? <laughs> or is it only black? Is it a, is it a case of the Model T Ford? <laughs> I should use that more often. Um, not trivially at all. I, I get that question a lot. Um, so first of all, how it compares to wood. Um, wood is a fantastic material, and this isn't a competitor to that in any sense, except that um, when you start to use wood in a formable way, uh, or when you want to form it, or when you need it to, to do something besides what a rough log would do in a structural capacity, uh, then you have additives, you have uh, fire retardants, you have um, glues and resins that are going to make the footprint of that wood material worse. And I think that's that's more of the problem, is that it's not as versatile unless you're using these additives or these processes. The other thing I would say, so so in terms of a footprint, it's not that bad. I think wood is quite wood paneling is quite a, a good option for a lot of things. I think um, if you were to compare like a, a panel of our material at the same thickness as a panel of wood, the difference is we're more dense with carbon and we're permanent. So over a hundred years, um, as the if, if it's an untreated wood product, as it starts to decay, you would have a re-release uh, with our material, you would not. So if you put that both materials in the landfill, one is going to re return back to the atmosphere and the other is not. And I think that's, so end of life is one consideration and um, formability and use and kind of density of CO2 storage are others. Um, flammability, yes, it does, it does combust. That's a problem with all biomaterials. So if you're not working in mined materials, you do have combustibility as a problem. Uh, we are working on compounds right now. We have a decent fire rating on them. Uh, we have a panel right now that's passing at Euro class C and um, we're targeting kind of the Euro class B, but you know, we are aware that we're not going to be as non-combustible as a cement fiberboard panel, for example. So these are development stages and uh, we're getting there, <laughs> that's the answer. Um, the other thing, the color, I am completely with Henry Ford on this one. Um, black is an honest color and it's uh, there's very little we can do without sacrificing the co2 balance of the material if we were to bring in colors we would lessen the impact on the climate um, we understand of course that a lot of markets depend on varieties of colors being an option you don't want to see maybe cities made all black um, so there is the reality to that and we're working on it um, but for now, we're focusing on the, the CO2 max um, product. Okay, thank so, you very much. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, there's, we have got another question. At the, uh, thanks. Uh, thank you for a very uh, informative lecture. And uh, it's very good to see the, how you uh, sort of clad the facade with a very unique... Uh, uh, you know, uh, bristle, which is a new way, new way of uh, dealing with, uh, uh, you know, uh, solar shading and also uh, sort of reducing the uh, air pollution. I just want to, uh, want, want to ask you, have you done any on-site monitoring after you have installed those uh, uh, paneling systems? And then so that there are some data that can justify the, the operational uh, um, sort of uh, the performance of your facade. Yeah, that's a great question. So that's, uh, we have not done field tests on the on the product and the reason for that is in order to understand the impact you need about six months of data before the building is built and six months of data afterward and so and that's a minimum uh, it's a very very tricky technology to test in the field uh, i think king's college has tried they did a published a huge study on it and it, the results are 
widely different from field study to field study. So we were not commissioned in time to be able to measure the, the situation on the ground before we installed the panels, for example, in Mexico City. And um, we were, so it didn't make sense to measure it for six months afterward. But what we do have are lab measurements we do like a laminar airflow in a in a in a closed controlled environment in a lab, and we can measure the before and after. So that's something that we've done, and that doesn't even account for the surface enlargement. So we've really just taken the lab results and um, and can apply them over the square meter of the projects. Great, thank you. Sure. Well, Alison, thanks, thanks again for for a wonderful lecture and also very inspiring to see how you, as a kind of startup, effectively um, with an idea for a, a product or an idea for a, a solution to a, 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 a very difficult problem such as pollution, kind of kind of made something. You I mean, literally made it yourself, then made it into a product and and continue to to do that so it's really 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 inspiring again and uh yeah such a great talk so thanks thanks so much thanks thanks again thank you thanks for having me Enjoy it. thank you Alison. so um look to, to log yeah. out of this thing it's, it's always rather yeah. complicated you go up to the it's the your left hand side there's a little tab at the top. Thank you. And then you scroll down to the bottom of the thing, and then. But thanks Great. again. But I got it. yeah, be in touch, and we'll get we'll send the send the book. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Thanks so much, yeah. Will. Nice to meet you. Yeah. You too. Bye. Bye. Bye.